Well, have I got a delight to introduce to you this evening our guest speaker, Yanis Varoufakis. As you know, former finance minister with Syriza, the democratically elected left-wing government of Greece, Yanis resigned when there was the uh, final uh, sign-up to the last bailout memorandum agreement, which was for further cuts. Yanis resigned. He is with us today. He is also uh, an economist, an academic, an author. I have a copy of his book here, for those of you who might be interested. Global Minotaur. I've not read it yet. If you want to uh, run out and buy it, I suggest that you do. Even if uh, you uh, maybe struggle through it, and it's much easier to listen to Yanis Varoufakis talking us through point by point, always makes it uh, go down very well. So, without further ado, Yanis Varoufakis, thank you very much. I'm standing here in front of you as somebody who has been educated in Britain. And when I say educated, I don't mean universities, courses, and degrees. My education began really a year after I arrived, after Mrs. Thatcher's victory, at the picket lines of the Cosby Steelworks. <laughs> it continued. That was a very big education, at the whopping dispute where we learned how to deter charging mounted police and various other instruments of democracy from <laughs> assaulting the picket lines. Uh, I got my PhD during 1984 in Nottinghamshire, in Kent, in Yorkshire during the NUM struggle. Therefore, you can imagine I'm pretty chuffed to be back in England and to be here in front of you. Austerity. Well, I have some news for you. Uh, John, I believe it's, your name is John, right? <laughs> James, I'm so sorry. I remember the Medway, but the John somehow slipped in. James was uh, absolutely spot on when he admonished to study there's a policy that doesn't work. Not only does it not work, if austerity were a student, he or she would have received a failed grade, a failed grade. Uh, if she or he were a driver, the license would have been revoked. If he or she were a medical doctor, he or she would have been stricken off the medical register. Austerity sucks. And I don't claim to be the author of those words. This is what President Obama said to me in the White House when we met. Very unpresidential, but extremely accurate. Now, the news of the last few days coming from Britain have been astonishing. Jeremy Corbyn, I don't need to add anything to that narrative. You are beginning, you are embarking upon a path that will not be rosy, that will not be e easy to tread upon, a path that will be mined and undermined by a toxic media campaign against this magnificent effort. And one of the instruments that the media are going to use is Greece. You will be told, just like Obama was, by the way, told in uh, 2012 in the election, in the presidential campaign, that if Obama was going to win, the United States would, would become like Greece. You're going to hear a lot of this, that if Corbyn gets elected, Labour will be like Syriza and the United Kingdom will be like Greece. I urge you to use Greece as an example by which to fight the forces of austerity and the forces of regression. Don't shun Greece. Use it. Why? Because Greece is the laboratory of austerity. We were the champions of austerity. There's been no austerity here. 
There's been talk about the state. The state has been used as an instrument, as a rhetorical device by which to accomplish different means. We were the country where genuine austerity was introduced. And let me give you an example. During the era that I alluded to before, under Mrs. Thatcher, who spoke of shrinking of the state and austerity. How much austerity was there? For one year, there was a diminution in public spending by 1%. That's it. That was all the austerity you had, we had in Britain. It was enough to take unemployment from 700 and something thousand to four and a half million. And at that point, Mrs. Thatcher utterly panicked. And if it wasn't for the Falklands War, she would have been forgotten by history. Mr. Osborne, he advocated austerity. He started doing a little bit of it. Can I tell you how much? One-eighteenth of what we did in Greece. And then what happened was that the recovery that was beginning after 2009 stalled immediately. And he backed off and he stopped doing austerity. He carries on with the language of austerity, but there's been no austerity. In Greece, remember, 1% in Britain was enough to create 4.5 million jobless men and women in this country. How much austerity did we have? We went from being the country in Europe with the highest deficit, budget deficit, to being the country in Europe with the largest structural surplus ever. We reduced spending by 14% in one and a half years. Not 1%, 14% in one and a half years. We cut public sector wages by 38%. Can you wrap your mind around that number? 38%. Pensions by 45%. Wages on average by 40%. We banned trades unions. Not we. They did. <laughs> the previous governments under the Troika. I mean, trade unions exist in Greece, but collective bargaining has been annulled. There are no collective bargaining agreements in Greece because the Troika pushed through Parliament overnight, when nobody was watching or listening, a bill that effectively annulled all collective bargaining. So there are no collective bargaining agreements in Greece. What was the argument from that era that, uh, that began in 1979 with Ma Mrs. Thatcher's victory, in favor of attacking labor, in favor of austerity, in favor of reducing wages, the argument was that this is a way to revive the economy. You reduce the price of something, you sell more of it. That happens with tomatoes and potatoes. If you want to clear a stock of unsold potatoes, you reduce the price and you get rid of them. It doesn't happen with labor. And Greece is proof of it. Because we reduced wages by 40% and more. And what happened to the labor market? Unemployment went from 8 to 28%. Employment collapsed. Unemployment would have been much harder, harder, harsher, and larger if we didn't have massive migration. There are so many Greeks around here that didn't used to be here, right? <laughs> Everywhere you go around the globe you find that phenomenon. There is a Greek invasion. We are also migrants as a result of this crisis. So it doesn't work. Now, the difference is that in Britain, the ruling class knows it and doesn't apply it, but utilizes the narrative of shrinking the state and of austerity in order to effect a massive transfer of income from the have-nots to the haves, of making sure that the costs of the financial crisis are transferred onto the shoulders of those who didn't cause it and those who can ill afford to hold on their shoulders that particular burden. Take the narrative of shrinking the state. Mrs. Thatcher never shrank the state. Never. If you look at the size of the state, it actually grew. The state has not shrunk in the last few years of Tory government, has it? It has not. All they are doing is they are trying to transplant the mentality of the bankers to the state. And what's the mentality? What is the dictum of the bankers? 
Never lend money to those who need it, right? Well, that's what they are doing with the state. Never have the state act on behalf of those who need protection by the state. That's all there is to it. When it comes to the SPIFs and to the bankers, we have socialism. We have the socialization of their losses, and you have a state which is extremely activist in pursuing their objectives. So we have socialism for the SPIFs and for the bankers, and we have the unfettered market, the arena, the Roman arena, on which, onto which we throw the weaker, those who need protection, working men and women, to be devoured by the lions of the free market. This is what the narrative has been everywhere, in the North Atlantic, throughout Europe. Of course, the difference is that Greece is part of the Eurozone. Now, you are lucky that Norman Lamont and after him, Gordon Brown, for all the wrong reasons, kept you out of the Eurozone. Sometimes good things happen for the wrong reasons. <laughs> we are in the Eurozone. So, compare and contrast. Osborne, a nice part. We Greeks love paradoxes. That's why paradox is a Greek word. So we love the idea of expansion and contraction. I mean, I consider myself to be a liberal Marxist. I like paradoxes. Expansion and contraction sounds like one of those paradoxes. Now, of course, it's not really, really a paradox in the case of Britain, because the expansionary part was very powerful. The Bank of England produced mountains of new money by which to prop up the city of London. How did they do it? By purchasing paper assets, debt, private debt, as well as public debt, which was used in order to bail out the banks. Who did they buy these pieces of paper from? From the bankers. In the hope that the bankers would then have the liquidity that would be necessary to lend to business, to invest in jobs and in growth. Now, of course, the contraction part, expansion and contraction, expansion was QE, what I just described. The contraction part was the part where the um, state is going into consolidation. That contractionary part was tried out for a year and a half, then it failed and it was stopped. So it was expansionary, full stop. It wasn't expansionary contraction. Now the problem with the expansionary part was that the problem for the labor world was that your economy was stabilized. It was like a patient that became very sick and it was stabilized. Health did not return, but at least you were into a kind of coma. A light coma. You understood, you could hear, but you couldn't speak. Yeah? And QE stabilized the British economy at that state. Which is not a bad thing, because death is worse. Yeah? Who benefited from this light coma? Well, if you look at house prices in the south of, south of England, you will know. If you look at the stock exchange, you will know, because when the Bank of England prints billions and billions and billions to buy these paper assets, which are mortgages, which are private debts of the banks, which are public debts, and so on and so forth, what happens is two things. Firstly, house prices increase in the parts of the country where wealth is concentrated. The wealthy people spend more. They the income increases, so there is this sensation among the ruling class that they've stabilized the economy because their bottom line has been stabilized. At the very same time, you have a situation where companies have access to cheap money, courtesy of QE. The tragedy, however, is what do they do with this money? Now, they're not dumb. They know that the rest of you cannot afford their goods and services. So they are not going to invest in productive activity in order to produce more of them. So what do they do? They borrow the money that the QE program is producing, giving it to the banks, the banks pass it on to the corporations, and what do the corporates do? They buy back their own shares. They let, borrow money to buy back their own shares, because that way they push the share price up, and guess what the bonuses of the CEOs are connected to? The share price. So they have more income, and all this Money creation, liquidity creation, does not find itself not only in the pockets of working men and women, but it doesn't even find itself 
into productive investment into capital. So we have a capitalism without capital. We have a capitalism with financial capital. We don't live in capitalism. In 1991, socialism collapsed in the socialist camp, and the left worldwide suffered a major defeat, both in the political and the moral defeat. And we're culpable for that, but that's another story. In 2008, capitalism died. I described the new system we live in as bankruptocracy, <laughs> the rule by bankrupt banks that have the political power to effect a transfer, a constant tsunami of money coming from the financial sector and from working people into the bankrupt banks, which remain bankrupt even though they are profitable. Because the black holes created during the years of Ponzi growth prior to 2008 remain. Now, compare this to Greece. In Greece, we didn't have expansion and contraction. We had Contractionary contraction. <laughs> we had the greatest degree of austerity in human history and a central bank that re removed liquidity from the markets. Now, it takes what? An eight year old to understand that this can't end well? Especially when you have a state like the Greek state that has overborrowed for many years. Why? In order to stay in a Eurozone which was constructed, constructed in a way that the deficit countries resemble people who don't have enough money, they go to a car dealer, they say, well, I want your car, but I can't afford it. So they get two things from the car dealer. They get the car and the loan. This was Greece between 1998 and 2008. We got the Mercedes-Benz, we got the Volkswagen, we got the Siemens uh, trains and so on, and we got the loans by which to pay it. And when the credit card hit, we had the Northern Rocket example. Um, case. What happened to Northern Rock? Northern Rock was borrowing constantly in, through the circuits of credit. And when those circuits of credit dried up, Northern Rock went under. Greece went under in the same way. And although those, those uh, uh, debts were unpayable, the flip side of the coin of German exports is the debt of countries like Greece, Spain, Ireland, and so on and so forth. It's part of the construction, the architecture of the years. So when the credit crunch hit, we did not have something like the Bank of England to stabilize the patient. We had the central bank, which had absolutely no power to intervene the way the Bank of England did. And then what our politicians did in Germany and in Greece and in Ireland, they went into a holy alliance, the purpose of which was to effect a cynical transfer from the books of the banks, losses from the books of the banks, onto the taxpayers in the name of solidarity to Greece, to Ireland, to Spain, to Portugal. So our cherished notion of solidarity was abused in the Eurozone in precisely the same way that the word democracy was abused in Iraq by the invaders. During the negotiations in which I represented Greece as a finance minister in the Euro group, I encountered combinations of irrationality and evil that you can only make up. You can't even make them. We were the only case, I believe, in the history of humanity where creditors, as I said before, were demanding of us that we sign a loan agreement, of me, as the Minister of Finance of Greece, that I should sign a loan agreement to take on another 80 billion euros worth of loans on conditions of austerity which they knew would shrink our incomes to such an extent that it would be absolutely impossible to repay that money. That has never happened. Creditors want their money back. Usually. They have bailiffs, they have various brutal methods by, by which to extract it. They break your knees, they do stuff. These were creditors that were predatory in that they were using 
this method of imposing further debt on an impoverished, bankrupt country, knowing that they wouldn't get their money back. You may very well ask why. Why would creditors want to do that? Well, because they were not the real creditors. They were the institutions that they were effecting this cynical transfer from taxpayers in Germany, in Slovenia, in Portugal, onto the books of the banks via the Greek state. So when you hear the German finance minister, when you hear the Slovak finance minister saying that they want their money back from Greece, don't believe them. The real game is power of politics. The real reason why our modest proposals, our totally moderate policies were rejected. Policies that even the Tories here, and I have surprisingly and finally enough friends in the Tory party. <laughs> and the reason why they have become friends is because they've come to lend support to me during this period saying, you know what, we believe in austerity, but what they are doing to you in the name of austerity is criminal. So they became my friends. I had Norman Lamont send me an email saying that it is preposterous what they are doing to Greece, that this degree of austerity will never work, and they know that it won't work, and he supported me. This is why we're friends. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. <right? laughs> So, the moment Europe is imposing such predatory loans on a small, proud nation in order to crush a government that dared challenge the failed programs that produced the greatest of great depressions in economic history upon it. The moment Europe is turning one proud nation against the, the other, is they turning the German workers against the Greek workers, when both of them are victims of the same policies. The moment we start thinking in terms of us against them, as a result of this fake austerity program, which is not even an austerity program, there's nothing austerian about lending us another 80 billion. This is the opposite of austerity. This is profligacy galore, which is presented as austerity. Why did they crush our government, our democratically elected government, for a very, very simple reason? It was a demonstration effect. To show to the Spanish people what will befall them if they dare vote for a party that forms a government that goes to the Eurogroup and doesn't toe the line. It's just brutal, primitive politics. That's what it is. So there is no state. But enough about Greece. The only reason why I'm using Greece in this context, I know that there is a great solidarity campaign for Greece. I'm not here to seek your solidarity for Greece. I'm here to offer the Greek people's solidarity to the people of Britain in what you're embarking on. In this struggle that you're embarking upon, you've got to use, use Greece as an example of why austerity cannot possibly work. Say to them, look at Greece. They did things that you wouldn't even have during a wet dream. <laughs> they did away with collective bargaining altogether. They crashed wages. They did away with pensions. Do you know how, what proportion of Greek unemployed people, workers, get uh, any, not you know, a single penny of unemployment benefit, I know you don't know. It's 9%. We have 28% unemployment, and of those unemployed masses of people, only 9% have ever received a single euro in terms of unemployment benefits. Now that, this is a libertarian's wet dream. And look at what happened. Has there been any export growth? Any increase in competitiveness? Yes, in terms of indices, we are extremely competitive. We are as competitive as Bangladesh. <laughs> but are exports increasing? No, because the whole system is broken. Because even competitive and productive firms with the capacity to export to the rest of Europe and the rest of the world have no access to credit because the banking system is broken. 
Because you can't have a banking system which is not broken when society is broken. So Greece is a good example of why austerity is not the issue, it's not an option. It's not that we should be seeking alternatives to austerity. Austerity is not even practiced in this country. So set it aside and look at what's going seriously wrong in this country and what has been going on for a while. So let's talk about you, not about us anymore. What should we do in this country? What should you do in this country? What should Jeremy Corbyn, what is Jeremy Corbyn thinking of doing? Well, I think that the, from the perspective of the Labour Party, is it not time that it stiffened its lip? Yes. For 30 years now, the only party in Britain that has disowned the class war, the class struggle, is Labour. The Conservatives are amazing class workers. They defend their folk tooth and nail. They go out to bat for them every single day. There has never been a misanthropic campaign against Labour that the Conservative Party has not stood behind. What about Labour? Beginning with the miners' strike in 1984, the Labour movement was abandoned by the Labour Party. The Labour Party has lobotomized itself. As Tony Benn said so succinctly once, it felt ashamed to criticize capitalism. When a Labour Party feels ashamed to criticize a capitalism that is becoming so degenerate as, as British capitalism has become, be, been becoming, we have a serious problem, folks. Look at what happened after Mrs. Thatcher left the scene. Financialization was all the rage already, as she was leaving. Tony Blair and Gordon Brown had the infinitely wise idea that we don't need to fight the class struggle anymore, like the Labour Party did in the 60s, for instance, under Harold Wilson. Harold Wilson, Wilson understood perfectly well that to fund the welfare system, to fund the National Health Service, there had to be an accommodation which results from a negotiation with the captains of industry. So capital was to be taxed in order to finance public services. Now, New Labour was not interested in uh, being seen as inimical to polite society. And they had another idea. Why not? fund the welfare state by taking a few crumbs off the tables of the City of London. Why not fund hospitals, which they did fund, schools, which they did fund to their credit, but not through this constant bickering with industry, but by means of taxing finance. Of course, the moment you go down that road, you have to let finance do whatever it wants. Because that is the way that it will accumulate paper profits from which you can then fund schools and hospitals. But once as a labor party, you stop thinking in terms of bargaining at the workplace, bargaining with industry regarding profit rates and the tax on profit rates. Once you give up on the idea that progressive taxation is a uniquely civilizing force in society, and once you depend increasingly on the financial bubbles in the city to fund hospitals, then effectively you give a green light to the finances to do as they please, hoping you will get a cut from their loot. Which they did get a cut from their loot. And this is why under Blair and Brown there was a significant increase in public services. But then when in 2008 those pyramids of paper money that the financial sector created collapsed, the Labour Party lacked both the analytical capacity and the moral, moral backbone to stand up to the financiers. And the result is... <laughs> and the result is, of course, the complete loss of faith of working men and women in labor and, in two words, Ed Miliband. <laughs> 
was never very diplomatic. And I don't intend to start now. Now, this is all diagnosis. What about the future? Well, it is important not to repeat the mistakes of the past. It is important that we should be looking to the future and not rushing to the past for easy answers. I mentioned before the whopping dispute and the miners' strike. They were magnificent collective action exercises in defending human rights in the end. But we were fighting to defend towers that were crumbling due to disruptive technologies. The printing unions were never going to survive when they were wedded to an old technology and they were resisting in a Luddite form the new technologies that Rupert Murdoch embraced. The attempt to keep the mines open was gracious and important, but we cannot today duties to the planet. If you are a 16-year-old in Mumbai, if you are a young person here in Manchester, in Southampton, in Edinburgh, who is not particularly interested in politics, who will not come to meetings like that, what you probably look up to is Silicon Valley. Your dream is to create an app that is a killer app and that will make you a, a millionaire or a billionaire. Until and unless the labor movement and the left manages to inspire these people who don't care about us and who don't care about collective action and for whom progressive politics, a kind of anarchistic streak in them, is all about the decentralizing power of technology, of information technology, of the internet. Unless we manage to form an alliance with them to make this their home, to embrace disruptive technologies, we will have failed. Harold Wilson in the 1960s. <laughs> Harold Wilson in the 1960s revived the labor movement and the, the Labour Party to be more precise. Because of the narrative of a drive for reinventing labor in the white heat of technology. I remember that was his expression. We need to go back to this idea except that we should replace the white heat of technology with a cool breeze of decentralizing disruptive technologies, which are also green. It's a tall order. It's not easy to do. How to combine the traditional values of the labor movement, of collective action, of cooperative enterprises with the disruptive technologies that the neoliberals have appropriated in the context of a narrative of emancipation through private investment into private goods. But this is the task ahead. For that purpose, we need to create new instruments of public investment into these disruptive technologies, into cooperative enterprises, into ways of showing to the young 16-year-old in Mumbai or in Manchester that there is in the labor movement an agenda for giving them the power that they need to use the technologies in order to go ahead, but to go ahead in a way that doesn't end up with them lonely, burnt out 30-year-olds. There are ways of doing it. Jeremy Corbyn very rightly criticized quantitative easing and he spoke of a people's version of quantitative easing. And he was lambasted from, from uh, the Financial Times and the Wall Street Journal for being a primitive. Now that is very interesting because you, know, you better get used to this. This kind of toxic uh, propaganda by the media is going to only get worse. But what I find quite ironic and interesting is that this was not an idea that came from the left, people's QE. Do you know who dreamt it up? 
a guy called Milton Friedman, who was Mrs. Thatcher's guru. The notion was helicopter money, that when you have, uh, when you are facing a potential depression, the central bank should print money and simply distribute it at that. This was a right-wing idea, a monetarist idea, but when Jeremy Corbyn puts it forward, it is to be lambasted and lampooned, yes? But, I believe that the Labour Party has to do some serious thinking and will do some serious thinking about the ways of combining the capacities of the Bank of England, which unfortunately we in Greece, in France, in Portugal, we don't have, with a development bank that is publicly owned and aims to create a stream of investment into these disruptive technologies at the micro level as well as at the level of corporations and the public sector with a new deal, Green New Deal project, which is financed by this development bank by issuing bonds which it sells to financiers and with the Bank of England standing by in the secondary markets ready to purchase these bonds in order to support them. That is the way to combine QE with investment, with growth and with disruptive technologies. This is just an example of the kind of thinking that the left has to embrace to move forward and not to look backwards for ideas. I'll finish off by a few lessons for the movement here in Britain that I bring along from Greece for the purpose. Your opponents, Diane, Jeremy, John, to create a national security issue and so on and so forth. This is what the media, the systemic media, will drum into people's heads, inside their living rooms, from their iPods, and so on and so forth. Don't fear that fear. People out there are perfectly capable of setting aside the propaganda if our leadership shuns hypocrisy, avoids spinning, and continues to speak truth to power, by bypassing the systemic media. We tried this in Greece and it worked. <laughs> the people can overcome fear if the leadership overcomes fear. My lesson from the last very painful few months, which I convey to you, is that the greatest enemy is fear within our ranks and within our government. The greatest enemy is not Margaret Thatcher, the greatest enemy is Ramsay MacDonald. Thank you.